Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Lee Montville and I'm the Director of Special Sales at Springer Publishing. Today we are presenting updates in Stroke Care 2023 with Diane LaClaughlin, an acute care NP at Baptist Lyerly Neurosurgery and Mayo Clinic in Florida, and Kat Kathy Morrison, a recently retired stroke program manager with Penn State. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that this webinar will be recorded. And if you missed any portion of the presentation, you can find the video on Springer Publishing's website, five to seven business days host event. And if you have any questions, we ask that you please type them into the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Diane and Kathy. Hey, thanks, Lee. Uh, th and thank you to Springer for having me and Kathy here to talk about stroke, which is one of those topics near and dear to us. Uh, I don't have any disclosures, but I always say that I'm happy to have some for the future. So reach out if something's uh, going on out there. The, the objectives of this are going to be to talk about where stroke care started uh, back a little over 20 years ago, uh, different studies that have come out in the last year that are going to change how we take care of these patients moving forward and just touch on what's in the works that hasn't been released yet uh, in the future. So some overview about stroke in general. Um, per the CDC in 2021, Stroke was the fifth leading cause of death uh, after heart disease, cancer, COVID, trauma, and then stroke. Uh, in fact, it's so common that every 40 seconds, somebody has a stroke. So just as we've been talking here, we've had two people have strokes. And by the end of this hour, 17 people will die of stroke. So it's a big deal and care has changed a lot and we continue to look for ways that we can improve how we take care of these patients. Uh, in order to continue on in a way that makes sense, we'll look at some of the common language that is utilized in these studies. So this is a picture that should look very familiar to anybody that takes care of stroke patients. And if you ever wondered what the official name of this is, it's called the cookie jar thief. Uh, and um, this obviously is a tool utilized in the NIH stroke scale. And so this is the most commonly utilized objective assessment tool in stroke, and it's been well validated and it's been found to correlate with outcomes. And so what that means is the higher the score, uh, it's consistent with severe stroke, large infarct size, and NIH is of 22 or greater are found to have a higher incidence of hemorrhagic transformation when these patients receive uh, thrombolysis. And that's actually true whether it's TPA, TNK, or mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, however, that doesn't negate that these patients benefit from that, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit more. Uh, now, a score less than four, these patients usually have favorable outcomes regardless of what treatment modality is utilized. But you have to keep in mind that it really matters where those four come from. Somebody might be able to live without significant disability with maybe a little minor facial droop or uh, some sensory loss as opposed to losing your language. And so uh, where the four points come from is super important. And then the other caveat is if you have a posterior circulation stroke, the NIH isn't that great. Uh, it's not that specific for posterior circulation. Some of you guys might not utilize the entire NIH stroke scale. They've actually come up with an abbreviated tool um, to make life a little bit easier for those doing Q15 minute, Q30 minute, Q hour neuro checks. Uh, but for research, it's going to be referring to the, the score in its entirety, so the original. Another term that you might see utilized, and this is really, really important when we're talking about outcomes, is the modified Rankin scale. 
And so this is a functional outcome scale. And uh, it ranges from you never knew that they had a stroke to the patient being dead. Uh, so, and six points are able to span quite a, quite a range. A lot of times in research we see they divide this up into what's considered a good outcome versus a poor outcome. And a lot of times that pivot mark is, can the patient independently ambulate or not? Uh, and dependent upon the researcher, that usually falls between two and three or three or four. And the difference there is two, uh, modified ranking score two is uh, you're able to independently walk without issue. Modified ranking of three, you require some type of assistant device, so a walker or a cane, and four, you need somebody to physically be there to help you. And that makes sense to use that uh, as a functional score because a lot of times that's the difference between severe disability and moderate disability. So you'll see us refer to this quite a bit as we're going through. And then because we're going to be talking about uh, thrombolysis, uh, something that initially started as the thrombolysis and myocardial infarction, we borrowed and like we did a lot of things that um, they did for acute coronary syndrome that we borrowed in stroke is we've changed this to the Tiki score, which is thrombolysis and cerebral infarction. And it again ranges from zero to three. And there have been some modifications over the last 10 years over 2, 2A, 2B, 2C, but it's talking about how much reperfusion do you get after thrombolysis. And so if you have uh, a Tiki of zero, it means that you have not restored any flow into the brain uh, through that occluded vessel, whereas a score of three uh, means that you've been able to completely restore normal perfusion uh, distal to where that occlusion was. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind with Tiki scores is even if you get a Tiki of three, damage has been done prior to that. And so it does not mean that if you achieve complete reperfusion that that patient is not going to have potentially significant stroke symptoms. And I think those of us that see a lot of uh, thrombectomy do see this. Um, but we'll still talk about the benefit as to why we do it. So we're going to start with the most common type of stroke, which is uh, acute ischemic. And, um, you know, then this, these images here, we're seeing a, a right MCA large vessel occlusion. And there are many different modalities that we can see this, everything from calculating an aspect score on a non-contrast CT of the head, where you're looking for little areas of established, established infarction. And so th that would be darker areas um, on the, the CT head. Uh, CT angiogram is great because you can very clearly see that there's an occlusion there and there's an arrow pointing at it that makes it much easier than it is in real life. And you can do a digital subtraction angiogram, which is where they're taking that patient uh, for angio for uh, either diagnosis or treatment, which is where they would perform thrombectomy. And then lastly, MRI, that you're looking for changes on DWI and then their correlation with ADC and flare signals. So a lot of ways to truly diagnose stroke. So where did care begin? Well, in the early 90s, stroke patients were some of the easiest patients to take care of because we didn't really have anything. And so we would get these patients, and I, I hate to sound crass, but they were uh, going to be severely disabled, and we turned them every two hours, and we made sure they had nutrition, and there wasn't much more that we had to offer. And so it wasn't until 1995 when TPA was approved. Uh, and so this was the first FDA approved treatment for acute ischemic stroke. And it was very specific criteria, patients that could receive this and a very specific timeline, which was initially they had three hours from symptom onset. Uh, when almost a quarter of patients come in with uh, out of clear last known well, you could see where that would be problematic. And then our use of TPA 
has continued to expand, but it wasn't until 2008. So if you think about it, that's quite a bit later that we expanded the time frame to four and a half hours after symptom onset. And that was via the European Cooperative Acute Stroke Study or ECAS-3 and showed that there was still benefit. And then uh, that same group more recently came up with ECAS-4 and then the EXTEND trial that looked at uh, giving it between four and a half and nine hours in patients that weren't eligible for mechanical uh, thrombectomy, or you'll hear me refer to it as EBT or endovascular treatment, uh, and then still had a mismatch between the core infarct or a stroke that had happened and then penumbra, which is the area at risk around it. And so even though ECAS didn't really show an improvement in those uh, functional outcomes, EXTEND did. Um, but both of these studies were terminated early uh, because we were having all of these endovascular trials that were coming out that were um, more positive outcomes. And so you'll see the care has shifted away from uh, TPA. So as I alluded to, a lot of these patients, uh, depending upon your reference, anywhere between 14 and 27 percent come in without a clear last known well. I will tell you, even patients that are sitting in the hospital sometimes don't have a clear last known well because you're not doing that type of exam on some of these patients. Uh, you'll hear us refer to them as wake up strokes sometimes because they go to bed fine and they wake up not being able to talk and we don't know really when that happened. Uh, and so uh, when they did the wake up trial and the Mr. Witness trials, really they were looking to see if uh, IV TPA worked and if it was safe to give it. And um, Mr. Witness more specifically was really looking at safety as opposed to efficacy. And um, Wake Up was using MRI to establish uh, if there was mismatch and how much uh, salvageable tissue there was. Uh, so again, with Wake Up, it terminated early, and this was due to lack of funding, which is kind of mind boggling when there's so much out there for stroke care. But more than half of the, the patients that got TPA, they were more likely to have a modified ranking of zero to one. So uh, more functional independence, uh, better prognosis than those that were placebo. Uh, so we don't really see this that much in practice though, right? When you have these patients come in with a unclear last known well, it's because now we have endovascular therapy. But some of you might not be giving TPA at all. And especially if, if you're newer to the field, you're wondering what I'm even talking about because we are starting to switch to TNK or to Nectoplase. So basically all the things that we didn't love about TPA, uh, they took and engineered a new form of it that lasts a little bit longer and you know, if you never gave TPA, it can be, uh, you have to calculate exactly uh, how much to give as a bolus, how much to give the rest of the hour. You have to remove whatever's extra so they don't get an incorrect dose. This is one single bolus dose, so much easier. Um, and so I'm seeing this becoming the, the mainstay. Now, I'll ask you guys a question about that in just a minute. Um, and of course, we don't just switch to something without having some evidence to support us doing so. And so um, one of these trials, uh, Extend IA, uh, which was looking into, at whether you should give TNK versus Alteplase or TPA before endovascular therapy, found that TNA, TNK was actually, uh, had improved revascularization and improved functional outcomes at 90 days as compared with TPA which I think was a little bit surprising uh, to people. And then more recently, if you're looking at the, the dates on these, uh, traits that was released this year, an act that was published uh, about a year ago, it was really just showing that TNK is non-inferior, which means that uh, you're not gonna get in trouble for using something that's unproven. But they had a lot of patients too, so they were good trials in that regard. Um, uh, they were over a thousand patients in each and uh, was just as effective. 
And so uh, that brought us into, uh, I don't know if it's formally called the golden age of EBT, but uh, I'm going to call it that because this was a really exciting time that we had all of these big trials come out that showed if you literally go in there and take the clot out, uh, then these patients do better. And it was, like I said, these were big trials and there was an agreement amongst all of them. And the caveat that kind of came out the next year was uh, when somebody did a meta-analysis of this, they found that the effectiveness declined with each passing hour. And so the conclusion that those authors made, and it may have biased uh, interventionalists over the, the coming years, uh, was that after the first seven hours, uh, you had less positive outcomes. And you're going to see we actually have gone the opposite way of that, which I'm very, very glad for. So now we hit 2017-2018. Uh, and again, I like the, you'll, all of these trials have kind of goofy names, but uh, that's how you know we work in neurology, because if we didn't come up with some way to make it nerdier, uh, it would be I'm unheard of in our group. Uh, but um, Dawn, like a play on Wake Up, and uh, Diffuse 3, uh, we're both looking at uh, endovascular therapy um, and looking at, in delayed time windows, how effective and how safe it was. And so the down trial showed increased functional independence, and that's going all the way up to 24 hours. So these this was great for patients that didn't have a clear last known well, right? Uh, but they did have to have a clinical imaging mismatch. So whether that was uh, CT perfusion or MRI, they had to show that they did have salvageable penumbra. Uh, and now Diffuse 3, a uh, little bit different, but similar. This was looking at the 6 to 16 hour time window uh, and had more specific uh, restrictions on if the core infarct size was 70 milliliters or less. So you're looking at where the tissue has already died, uh, essentially. Um, and that's what you're looking for, again, on aspects when you're comparing DWI, um, how much of that tissue is already gone. Um, something interesting about Diffuse 3 is about 40% of those patients uh, wouldn't have met the, the clinical imaging criteria of the DAWN trial. So it's not necessarily uh, comparing the same thing as maybe a little more apples and, and oranges, uh, but Diffuse 3 actually terminated early because of interim analysis. And we're seeing this over the last, I don't know, five years of studies that uh, endovascular treatment is so superior that they don't have to complete the trial. And then Aurora took all of these, uh, the data from all of these studies from 2015 to 2018 and looked at thrombectomy after six hours of last known well, and again, found uh, the same trend, which was improvement in patient outcomes as measured at, with modified Rankin. And then um, our, our treatments changed. And so these patients come in, and as long as there's salvageable penumbra, they're going to thrombectomy. But we actually had these like three big studies come out in the last year. And um, uh, it's not a surprise that part of the reason that we're here with Springer is that we've done a work on stroke. And even since the we finished writing, uh, Select 2 and Angel Aspect came out. And it is going to change who is a candidate for thrombectomy. And so rescue, we'll talk about these in more detail uh, separately. But the question is, uh, does endovascular therapy, in addition to our usual medical care, improve outcomes in patients that had large strokes? Uh, because most of those other trials excluded patients that had a large infarct uh, or had big established strokes. Those patients were all excluded. So now we're saying these patients that we see that have high NIHs and big strokes, is there any benefit? So rescue Japan limit, 
Uh, and they were looking at aspect score. So like I said, you start at a 10 for aspects and then you count down one for every area that looks like it's established infarct uh, or hypodensity on non-con. So it looked at an aspects of three to five, which is pretty low because a lot of times these other trials uh, excluded less than eight. Uh, and then if they've presented within uh, six hours of symptom onset or within 24 hours if they didn't see a change on flare on MRI. And uh, you're not going to be surprised by the outcome, which was uh, whether they had good functional outcome at 90 days. And they divided their modified Rankin as ability to walk independently, even with an assistive de device uh, versus not being able to walk. And they found that about a third of the patients that underwent endovascular uh, had good outcomes as opposed to only 12% in the medical group. And these were well matched. Um, the one caveat is they had a uh, lot more ICH uh, within the stroke bed of patients that received EVT, but typically it uh, was not symptomatic because you're bleeding into an already established stroke bed. So those symptoms are already there. Um, and so there were some limitations to this. It was unblinded, uh, which means there could have been some bias, especially in reporting uh, and looking at safety outcomes like symptomatic ICH, that word symptomatic is important. And if it's unblinded, there could definitely be an introduction of bias there. And then even though we, utilize modified Rankin, this was validated by neurology sitting face to face with the patient uh, to evaluate those scores. And a lot of uh, these studies utilize phone follow-up uh, to see what the functional outcome is. And sometimes they're not talking to the patient themselves or talking to a caregiver. Uh, so the author's conclusion was, okay, well, this uh, is a great thing, and this is what we should do. Uh, the general public is essentially, this is promising. Uh, however, this study, there's going to be some bias, and we shouldn't necessarily change our practice based upon this. And so that was 2022. So now enter this year. And so these are the two that have been really, really exciting since we finished writing, uh, which is Select2. And this was across 31 different centers at uh, kind of the Western world here uh, in the U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, and this is another one that stopped early because uh, we had our answer. And so we looked at aspects of three to five in uh, a core volume. So that, again, that core infarct size of at least 50 milliliters. So these are patients that came in with established strokes. Um, and so... Only about a fifth of these patients got IV thrombolytics. The average core volume was about 80 milliliters in both group, median aspects of four. And randomization occurred uh, nine to 10 hours. And again, there was a significant shift in the modified rink and favorite throm thrombectomy. And so it stopped early because they found that so many of these patients did better with endovascular therapy that it, to continue to allow patients not to receive this treatment was actually um, an ethical issue. Uh, again, there was a, a little bit more ICH, but it was not symptomatic. Uh, so a little bit of uh, leaky blood brain barrier probably in these patients, which is why there's also been a, a trend to using dual energy uh, to help establish uh, contrast leak versus hemorrhage, but into the, the stroke bed, not symptomatic. Um, there was substantial reperfusion in 80% of the patients, low incidence of complications, but you could have hematoma, um, arterial excess site occlusion, some vasospasm, perforation, dissection. But in short, patients that received thrombectomy, both statistically and clinically, had significant improvement in their outcomes, uh, functional independence, and the ability to independently ambulate without significant increases in symptomatic ICH or mortality. So this alone was really exciting. But then we added in angel aspect as well, 
uh, again, looking at very similar criteria as select two, um, and again, had very similar outcomes. Um, and this one, there was maybe a little bit uh, more symptomatic ICH reported, and they actually required uh, more decompressive hemicranies, and I'm not sure anybody has a great explanation for that. Um, but in the group receiving intervention, it, there was not statistically significant uh, more ICH in general, but they did say uh, a little bit more symptomatic than the other studies. But again, these patients had huge differences in what their functional outcomes were at 90 days. And you can see some of these here. Um, and so looking at the three that we talked to, and there are three still going on, um, it's important to point out a, a couple things as somebody that likes to read and analyze data, is that a lot of times the improvement that we see when these patients have high aspect scores in pretty much all penumbras, we have this almost like Lazarus effect that they already have a smaller core. And so then we perform uh, mechanical thrombectomy and we say, oh, look, they're so much better. Well, these patients were probably going to do better anyways. Uh, and so seeing patients that would have had a certain core outcome uh, achieve any one point swing on that modified Rankin is substantial to the quality of life of the patient. And that we're able to show that is going to show a trend to taking patients for thrombectomy, uh, regardless of what their NIH is, as long as there's some degree of salvageable tissue. Um, and so important to discuss that with, with families when they come in. So I said there are three more coming that are looking at the same thing, uh, and they're looking at uh, thrombectomy in that extended time frame. And so we'll have an even stronger pool that will further shift our current practice. So something else that we've spent some time looking at are tandem occlusions. And what that means, and you can look at the, the picture here on the, the slide that's looking at angiogram, and it's where you have a ipsilateral, so same side uh, carotid stenosis or carotid occlusion in addition to the, the intracranial anterior circ circulation LVO. So in this case, uh, an MCA blockage. Um, and it's pretty common and it, it makes some sense if you're gonna have an issue intracranial, a lot of these patients have extracranial issues as well. Um, but we don't know how to treat these, uh, whether it's better to treat the carotid at the same time. And sometimes you have to because there's no other way to get through uh, versus treat the the intracranial LVO and then come back for the carotid after like a cool off period. And so we don't know the best way to do this. And um, they did a survey uh, a couple years ago and there was a wide variability in practice. And so no consensus existed at the time. And so we started to look at what the best way to handle that is and there's actually only one that's published right now which is escape uh and it didn't show lower it they were not um if you try let me start over all right so escape showed that a concurrent tandem lesion so ica and the anterior circulation lvo it didn't lower the odds of a good functional outcome. And that was regardless of whether or not you treated the carotid. Um, but the trial has some issues in that it only enrolled patients that had decent collaterals. And so a lot of the patients that were really asking this, uh, if they don't have good collaterals, they're really going to have an issue um, feeding that area of the brain. And so uh, in a more recent meta-analysis, they looked at pooled data from existing studies, and they did show that stent placement, uh, in addition to endovascular therapy, was associated with more favorable functional outcomes without increasing mortality or ICH. But it didn't specifically answer the question because you're using old data from a bunch of other studies with a bunch of different uh, inclusion exclusion criteria. So the three ongoing studies are really going to help answer this question. 
uh, looking at what's the role of carotid stent placement in patients with acute stroke and tandem lesions. Posterior circulation. So these are the ones that scare me um, because as you guys know, the posterior fossa, one, there's not a lot of room for swelling. And the same explanation that I give families is if I hit my hand on this table and it swells to twice the size, it might look goofy, but it's not going to cause me a major issue in terms of um, circulation because there's nothing surrounding it. But if I put a glove on tightly around my hand and do the same thing, well, then I could lose that hand because uh, it's pushing up against the glove and I'm not able to get any type of flow to any of the hands. And so uh, we know that it's very tight back in the posterior fossa, and so any swelling could be devastating. Uh, we also know that what the vessels feed back there are the things that make you alive, like your ability to breathe, uh, which is part of the reason that we're so concerned when we see basilar artery occlusions, which is what the BAO stands for in this slide. Uh, I think everybody's worst nightmare is locked in uh, which is if you have an occlusion, uh, full occlusion of the basilar artery, what you see. And so um, we did find from the Mr. Clean registry, which is something I alluded to earlier, that the most common causes of posterior circulation occlusions are large artery athero and cardioembolism. Uh, so it just tells you about our healthy lifestyle. Uh, we are seeing... Uh, an improvement in outcomes now uh, with patients that receive thrombectomy. Uh, and so the initial study uh, back in 2013, back to the basics, that one didn't actually show an improvement. And so uh, based upon that, nobody was excited about going after these uh, vert or basilar occlusions. But then everything since... Uh, since then has changed that. There were, there were issues with that initial basic study. Um, Non-consecutive enrollment, third of those patients were treated outside of the trial uh, that were eligible to be in it. Um, and most of those patients received thrombectomy. So it definitely just showed a lot of bias in the study that they excluded them from the trial and then performed thrombectomy and had better outcomes. So then in uh, 2020, we did the best trial and that was discontinued early as well because it was poor recruitment and high crossover rates that initially somebody might have been uh, randomized to non-thrombectomy and then still received thrombectomy. But then again, going into the last year, um, and I don't know how to say Bayosh, but um, looking at the basilar artery occlusion Chinese endovascular letter study and then the attention trial, uh, which is again a, a Chinese study, and they showed that these patients uh, presenting between six and 12 hours um, or 12 hours of less known well in attention respectively, um, that these patients trended towards better outcomes, better functional scales, decreased mortality. So now we're making some progress on ischemic stroke. What about uh, intracerebral hemorrhage? So this is considered uh, the deadliest type of stroke uh, with high uh, rates of disability following. Uh, and we haven't done much to advance the care for these patients, uh, period, honestly. And about 80% of people that have it do have significant disability. Um, with medical complications actually contributing to a lot of the deaths because these patients are in the hospital a long period of time. We just had new guidelines come out uh, last year. And, you know, a lot of the trials that have occurred over the last 10 years are looking at surgeries and guidelines say that really the usefulness isn't well established and that early evacuation, and they're talking about open crany for evacuation, isn't clearly beneficial and that this should be considered a life-saving measure only. And keeping in mind, uh, they're not talking about infratentorial bleeds, like we were talking about the posterior fossa before. This is talking about supratentorial. Uh, but the new guidelines say that minimally invasive 
may be useful. And that's because we're starting to get some signal that way. And there's some trials underway and then coming out soon uh, that might shift the paradigm. And then the European society was similar that there's no evidence to support routine surgical intervention. And again, they're talking about open cranies. Uh, so this was actually, I, I borrowed this from, uh, and Rich did a, a webinar talking about their study results, uh, which we'll talk about in Rich in a minute. But this looked at some of the trials that have been done over the, the last 10 years, looking at safe ways to remove a clot. And really the value of removing the clot is for ICP control, which is relevant if the, um, the lesion or the uh, hematoma volume is greater than 30 milliliters to prevent expansion and to prevent secondary inflammation, which we kind of feel like is a lot of the issue, the perihematoma edema that occurs. Uh, and so most of these studies, stitch, stitch two, didn't show improvement in mortality or functional outcomes. So there was a, a trend away. The minimally invasive technique, when people got super excited about it, uh, when they did MISTI-3. And so MISTI-3 looked at, um, does ICH reduction via minimally invasive improve functional outcomes? And these were patients with good GCSs, I mean, good, greater than six, super tentorial, uh, doing this less than 72 hours in greater than 30 ml clones. And uh, what they did is they used uh, CT imaging guidance and they placed a catheter directly into the hemorrhage and they gave TPA through it, which uh, people were, if you're not familiar, are kind of like, wait, this patient already has a hemorrhage and now you're giving them a thrombolytic directly into it, but it's so that you could liquefy uh, the clot that's occurred there to help remove it. And you continued to do that until the volume was less than 15 milliliters. And um, they actually did decrease mortality rates to what was below estimated rates for severe ICH. Um, but really this was more a safety study than anything. So they found it was safe. There weren't more complications than usual care. It did prevent death. So it shifted you from a modified ranking of six. Um, but I don't know how you feel. I don't know if I think modified ranking of five is better than a modified ranking of six. Um, kind of the really poor taste joke is that, uh, modified ranking of five is you're not dead, but you wish you were because you're not really doing anything. Uh, you're completely dependent. You don't really have any interaction with the environment around you. Uh, so because it didn't improve functional outcomes, it wasn't readily adopted, but it still put the idea in people's head that, you know, what, maybe if we get this right, then this is still going to be a good technique. And so incomes and rich, which again, is designed to look at minimally invasive um, parafascicular surgery, specifically looking at low bar and basal ganglia bleeds. And um, this was announced at the American Academy of Neurosurgery Conference in April, and they've been presenting it at all the major conferences. So Neurocritical Care Society's conference was two weeks ago. They presented it there as well. Um, it just hasn't actually been published yet. But it seems very exciting. There were a lot of uh, patients excluded, but it was 36 sites, about 300 patients. And at six months, functional outcomes for patients that did receive uh, a minimally invasive evacuation were significantly improved, and specifically a low bar, and more so than basal ganglia. And so even though the results aren't published, there's a buzz in the community that we're going to see more and more and more, and future guidelines are going to recommend this technique. Uh, and then I just put a last little buzz for Interact 3. This is probably one of the only medical trials that have come out uh, that looked at whether a bundle of controlling blood pressure, hyperglycemia, pyrexia, and uh, coagulopathy uh, put into place uh, within six hours of symptom onset that improved outcomes uh, with only like one to 3% having issues with hyperglycemia and pyrexia early on. And uh, they did find uh, an improvement, but there were honestly a lot of issues with this study. So I don't think it's gonna shift practice. 
and I, there was a lot of bias towards wanting early blood pressure control. And because most of the patients came from China, the way that we controlled blood pressure, hardly any of these patients were receiving cardine. Uh, and then hardly of any of these patients were on anticoagulation. And so the patient population is a little bit different. But what it does bring into uh, thought is whether having a bundle makes people more aware the same way that um, when somebody comes in with acute ischemic stroke symptoms, we are running towards these time goals, whether now that we have minimally invasive surgery and uh, are able to set goals with ICH, if that'll have us paying more attention early on to easy things that are controlled, uh, we should probably do that. And so those are really a lot of the big trials that have come out in the last year that could shift practice. So I'm going to open uh, this up for questions and thank you again to Springer for their support and, and uh, having us here to talk about what's interesting. And Kathy will kind of tell you how we got together uh, to work on this. Yeah, thanks, uh, Diane. Great job. Great job. Um, you know, several years ago, the pandemic slowed a lot of things down, but we got this idea. We started noticing this trend toward advanced practice providers not just nurse practitioners, but, you know, PAs and um, clinical nurse specialists, pharmacists. And um, but the fact that they were getting more roles, there were more opportunities in stroke care. And we felt that, okay, there we've been successful with, you know, getting some information out to nurses in general. But now we have to acknowledge these advanced practice um, professionals who maybe would like a quick guide, something they don't have time to read textbook after textbook. And so we got this idea and thank you to Springer for hooking Diane and I together. We've actually never really met in person, but we seem to be very like-minded and we're um, excited and passionate about getting this book together. So um, thank you Springer for your patience with us. And uh, I feel like they worked well together. You'll find their 17 chapters, we pulled experts from around the country because no, stroke has a lot of subspecialties. So whether it's acute care or follow-up care, you know, the research, the um, thrombectomy stuff, the other surgical treatments, imaging, we've got a great chapter about you know, with tips about um, interpreting imaging um, because not everybody gets that in, in their educational flow. So, um, what do you have to say, Diane? Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I love when you work on a project and you actually learn from it while you're doing it. Uh, and we really did get great people to contribute. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the people that did the endovascular chapter uh, work at Cleveland Clinic and they were involved in a lot of these trials and are kind of early adopters of endovascular treatment. And so hearing their perspective as to uh, how to take care of these patients, having a uh, neurocritical care pharmacist write a chapter on uh, the medications that we use every day uh, was really useful. And so like I said, and the other thing is I work in critical care. I'm not sure that I knew exactly how some of these patients do after everything. And so the aftercare was interesting to me as well. Um, so it's it's a good book and I'm I'm glad that we I, I always joke that we swiped right on each other. <laughs> and so I'm glad that we did because uh, <laughs> it's been really fun working together. Yeah. This is this is Lee Montville from Springer Publishing. Thank you, Diane and Kathy, for such an excellent and informative presentation. Um, I just wanted to say to those, we had multiple people who joined mid-webinar that the full recording will be sent to you. So please be aware of that. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a couple of questions. Just a reminder, if anybody wants to add or type type your questions in, please put them in the question box um, for in the, your control panel. So the questions we got from the audience, Diane and Kathy, are, um, if your center does not perform a thrombectomy, what should you know prior to sending the patient to an EBT-capable center? So that is a great question because it happens all of the time. Uh, last known well is always important. If they do receive thrombolysis, that's important. Uh, the time that you give it, 
uh, what their initial exam was and if you saw improvement or deterioration. Probably the number one thing I would advise is a lot of outside hospitals want to drive the blood pressure down and absolutely don't. Still utilize the guideline of if they receive uh, TPA or TPNK less than 180, don't drive these patients to blood pressures of 130, 140. They need that flow. Uh, so that would be, those would be the most important things for me. What do you think, Kathy? Anything I'm missing? Yeah. Well, the one thing that I came to mind is, you know, and it's in the, the book, a chapter on the pre-hospital. You know, that's becoming such a huge part of our acute stroke care. Um, hopefully the uh, EMS services in your area are becoming familiar with the severity scoring, the large vessel occlusion uh to kind of predictor tools. None of them are exactly perfect, but if they can give you an idea, you know, the information they can bring you, and um, if they will do that uh, large special occlusion predictor tool, that's another piece of information that might help you to know almost right away that you're going to have to arrange a transfer. I'm going to add one more thing, uh, which is part of that too. A lot of these patients get to your hospital and family never gets there before they're moving on to the next one. That family contact so we can call and get consent is important. Um, it's If it's emergent, we would still do it, but it's always better to try to explain the procedure to somebody, give them reasonable expectations, and then get consent. Perfect. We have a couple more questions and recognize that we're almost at our hour. So thanks, everybody, for hanging on. Um, how do patients with large hemispheric stroke do in terms of prognosis? So this is another good question. And um, so I actually, I just wrote a chapter for another book about neuroprognostication. And I will tell you the way that I thought they did, uh, only seeing patients in the ICU is not actually how they do. A lot of them have uh, better outcomes than I would have expected. Again, the trick here is knowing, uh, one, where the occlusion is and what's acceptable to the patient. So somebody with a, a right MCA stroke, even traked and pegged initially in the ICU, uh, if they're able to, in the future, understand and talk because language is on the left, still might consider that a good outcome because they can communicate with the world. Now, the other side of that is somebody with a big left MCA stroke. Even if they can't speak, if they can interact with their world, they still have understanding, they just can't verbalize it. Now, there tends to be more frustration in that group, but these patients survive. Do they need extra support? Yes. Whenever you're talking a whole hemisphere gone, these are patients that are going to be dependent upon uh, care for their their daily living activities. Uh, but does it mean that it's a poor outcome? It, it all depends on what's acceptable to the patient. They've also studied how patients feel about that uh, years later. And where it's really cavalier for me to sit here and be like, well, if I can't tie my own shoes, like count me out. These patients actually are very grateful to be alive and happy with how they're doing uh, years later, which to be honest, was surprising to me. Um, so I think when we see them acutely, we don't realize that a lot of these patients, even if you don't recover the tissue that's infarcted, uh, they're happy that they're alive and their quality of life. And yeah, and I want to say we oh, sorry. go, and that's okay, Lee. Um, I just wanted to point out that that was something that Diane had uh, really rallied for that we would have that end of life care chapter in this book as well, um, because as as you all are suggesting, that we do have to deal with that. Um, there are there are some bad outcomes. And then we had a couple of questions about the new book, and uh, I've, since we're down to just a couple more minutes, here's uh, the first question that came in, which is: My friend is a PA and has been just hired by a neurology service. She will be interpreting head CTs. Does this book contain information on reading images such as CTs? Yes. Yes, okay. it does. Yes, Perfect. it does. Perfect. Yeah, Perfect. some wonderful practical tips. Yeah. 
Yeah. And um, we wanted to just let people know, my colleague Gina Martinez wanted me to let people know that the code for the discount is webinar 23. You will all receive that information. Um, so I, I wanted to thank everybody again for coming today. It This presentation was incredible and it looks like we've covered our questions. So thank you for spending time with us today. And thank you again, especially to Diane and Kathy for such a great presentation. Um, as I mentioned, if you're interested in purchasing any of um, Diane and Kathy's books with Springer for the 25% discount, please use the code webinar23 at checkout on springerpub.com. And me, as I can I just yeah, interrupt you sure. a second? Well, on the screen that I'm looking at, it says webinar 25. I, I know it should say 23 and Gina okay. messaged me to just pass that along, but we okay. will be sending that information to everybody. And just as I said, a couple of minutes ago, we had about uh, five or six people who joined us mid um, webinar. We will be sending the full recording of the webinar to all of you and to everybody who has registered. And this recorded se session will also be on our website, springerpub.com in five to seven days. So thank you again, Diane and Kathy. We want to wish everyone a wonderful rest of the week and a great afternoon. And we look forward to you joining future Springer Publishing webinars. Thanks and have a great day, everyone.